I'm here to officially let you know that my time as your first lady has come to an end. My husband, your pastor, has asked me for divorce, and I see no reason to stay in a marriage that I only want to maintain. It has been my pleasure to serve you for the last four years. Thank you for your patience and allowing me to come into my own in God's time. It is my prayer that my God got the glory in all that we have been able to accomplish together. Greetings. I'm G. Craig Lewis of EX Position. EX Ministries. And this is the Exposition. This is our season two of the Exposition, and this is episode five. Um, first, I just want to thank all of you for the support, the comments, the suggestions, all of that. Uh, we just appreciate you watching it. Um, and uh, make sure you check out season one. Covered a lot of great things in season one. Uh, and we're covering a lot of good things in season two, uh, most of it per your request. Uh, and today we're going to be dealing with, just like the clip you just saw, we're going to be dealing with divorce and remarriage. Uh, this is a touchy topic uh, that gets avoided a lot. A lot of uh, preachers um, in different places don't like to talk about it because a lot of them are on the verge of it or have already done it. And so it's a difficult subject for them. Uh, so it's it's a difficult and a touchy subject, but we're going to deal with it here because this is the exposition. And so we're going to expose the lies and tell the truth. <laughs> uh, and I have with me today uh, Jay Bryan and also Carmina Barnett. Uh, Y'all doing all right? All right. Pastor. OK, so we're going to jump right into this discussion. Uh, Carmina, what you got? Well, Pastor, after looking at the video that we just saw, it makes me think about when I was growing up in church. You didn't see that. You didn't see, especially as it relates to our pastors and our leaders and things like that. But you just didn't see couples divorcing. And we saw situations where we thought it might have been biblically acceptable to get right. divorced, but they still remained in it because it was almost like they would rather be in that situation, unhappy or whatever, than to be called a divorcee. So let's talk about that for a minute. Why was that? Um, if, you, if you think about it back then, people, they really didn't um, look at divorce as an option, right? They, they didn't believe in divorce. And so they tried to make the best of whatever situation they were in, if you really think about it. So, um, but then on the other end, if you think about it, even the believing wife would tolerate the unbelieving husband mm -hmm. and still went to church and just, you know, made the best of it. It was, it was no, no bad mouthing or anything. I mean, if you knew, you knew, but you didn't know because the woman made light of it or... Uh, made mention of it much. Mm -hmm. um, but if we look at Luke 17, 4, it says, and if he trespass against thee seven times in a day, and seven times in a day turn again to thee, saying, I repent, thou shalt forgive him. So it was that scripture, that foundation, that, that as church, as Bible-believing um, Christians, we would stand on that. If somebody did you wrong, or in this case, divorce was not the answer, we just forgive you and we keep working at it until you know, things get better because it's, it's going to get better. Yeah, well, yeah. yeah. I mean, they, the man be on the porch while she was at church. And yeah. He'd be in an old abandoned car smoking his cigarettes and drinking his 40. Mm -hmm. While, while playing dominoes. Playing dominoes. Yep, they, they didn't she have would, a PlayStation. She would fix some breakfast before she went to service. Yeah. Came yeah. back home and fixed Sunday supper. Yep. I mean, it was, yeah, it was because just a routine. They figured for the sake of the children uh, a lot of times, and most of the time it was for the sake of the Holy Ghost. And they would just say it. The Holy Ghost told me to stay. Yeah. And I mean, they'd be proud to tell you that. And so it was just a different time back then. And, and I think a lot of in a lot of cases uh, back then, the order of the home was more biblically sound. Mm -hmm. And that changes everything mm -hmm. because you had the man, even though he may have been smoking his uh, cigarettes, his homemade road ones, or he may <laughs> have been drinking or whatever. He would go to work every day and pay all the bills Provide, right. yep. and the mom would be at home with the children like you know her rightful place is so it wasn't a situation that you would just bounce from uh you know it was it was a little different and what i discovered today putting this together you know um and just really wanting god to help me with this subject matter because this is this is so touchy i i was just really wanting god to speak to me so i could say the right things mm -hmm. uh at planning this uh particular lesson mm -hmm. But I learned something today. 70% of divorces today are requested by women. Wow. Yeah. Bam. Wow. So that, that, that's the difference right there. Back in the day, women were taught 
churches would teach the women. There were women, I mean, the first, the, 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 I don't want to say first lady because I don't like that term, but the pastor's wife in the old church was content with teaching the younger ladies. Yes. Yeah. She was content with teaching the women in the church. Now she wants to teach the men. And she wants to emasculate her husband in many cases. And she wants to be the voice, the leader of the church, you know. And so that changes everything because now you don't have anyone teaching the younger women how to be good wives, how to love their husbands, how to love their children. Yeah. They just have to fend for themselves. And then they're seeing the example of a big old bully woman. Right. You know, running everything and getting up, taking the mic and, you know, just yeah. stronger yeah. than him and pushing him down in the pulpit. Sit down. You know, they, I mean, they just watching all this emasculation going on. <laughs> She's trying to out preach him and people requesting. I'd rather hear her than him and all this old foolishness. So back then it was just a different time because uh, uh, women were taught how to love their husbands and children. And today they're taught to be independent. Yeah. So they're basically taught to not need a man mm -hmm. from jump. And even pastors are pastor in the church. And as soon as their daughter come of age, bam, we're sending you to school so you can get a profession. You worry about being a wife later. Right. You know, and it's not even a consideration anymore to be a wife and a mother. Mm -hmm. uh, they aren't even training them up. So, But, Pastor, let me ask you this. Can we say even before they get to college age, they start teaching them that at a very young age? Have you seen examples of that? Well, yeah, yeah. They teach them at a young age. Uh, I mean... The, the fifth birthday, they get a doctor's kit. Yeah, you know, they do. So <laughs> you're going to be a doctor when you grow up. Mm -hmm. But mommy, I want a husband. Girl, you don't want no husband. Look look at me and your daddy. You know, I mean, it just, you know. Because <laughs> we were talking just before we came out during our preparation. I was telling you it was a movie that we were watching as a family last night. And even in the movie, um, you had two young boys. I guess the age in the movie, they're about six or seven years old. Two young boys and a young girl. And the two young boys wanted to be outside build, and they wanted to build a tree house. Okay. They were doing things with their hands. The young girl wanted to tag along because she was, you know, enamored, I guess, by them doing such a good job with the tree house. But she was pulling along a baby stroller with a baby doll in it. Hmm. And they were questioning, like, why are you, you know, basically, you're like, why are you bringing this girl stuff? And she said, well, I'm preparing for my life. So even as a six or seven year old little girl, she was bringing along a child, understanding what she was saying in her home was being modeled. Mm -hmm. So even in that, you don't see that anymore, even in yeah. TV shows or anywhere. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and so I said all that to say, once the woman is ruling the home or we're in this matriarchal society or whatever, when the women rule the home, uh, they're going to rule it emotionally because the woman is emotional, right? And divorce is an emotional decision, not a logical one. So when we're talking about the divorce rate, it's going to be higher among women because the women are in control now or they are co-op partners in the marriage to where they're in a place where they can, you know, make the decision to divorce. Right. Well, if they're going to make an emotional decision to divorce, then that's going to make it more prevalent. Uh, you don't see divorce is not a logical decision. If you sit down logically and come down off the way you feel you'll make a better decision, and it's usually not to divorce. Uh, scripture in uh, Ephesians 5 and 22 says, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husband as unto the Lord. And this is the problem. Many women don't know how to do this because instead of being taught that in the church, the, the older women in sound doctrine that's supposed to teach it uh, would much rather teach the entire congregation and emasculate the man. So I think it's fair to say after the discussion we just had even now that the climate has totally changed from what we explained before. So now it seems like divorce is the first and the easiest option in relationships. And unfortunately, a large number of that is impacting the church. And that's our pastors, our leaders and things like that. What changed that caused that to be so prevalent? Well, well, the price is two hundred dollars now. So I'm sure that <laughs> like has something to do cheapen with it. the cost of divorce. <laughs> You can get them on sale. Right, right. No, I mean, but it, it, bad examples have caught up with this. It's essentially what is taking place, Carmina. Okay. So what happens is because the church has become, begun taking cues from society or from the world, uh, you know, and, and since divorce has, be, you know, taking cues from the world, from society, let me start over. Because the church has begun taking cues from society, and since divorce has become a societal epidemic, and in turn, it, it influences the carnal leadership of our churches. Okay. So if, 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 my whole approach to maintain my 
my relevancy as a leader in the church is I want to see what the world is doing to keep their large audiences because it isn't true conversion that the leaders are after. They're after the platform so those platforms can produce bigger business so that bigger business can lace their pockets and give them the notoriety they've been wanting since they were five years old. So there's a there's a continual situation there where we're, we're looking to the world and seeing what the world is doing and then we adopt that versus using the Bible. So, so you're saying I can't look at my reality show of my favorite couple and follow them? You should not. Ooh. Those should not be your goals. <laughs> that, sh that should not. So, okay, clarity. Well, right. Uh, well, we, sh we shouldn't be influenced by the world. First John 2 and 16 states, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. So that's that's clearly stated. So we don't look at divorce as a means to freedom or as or as a means to start over we look at the divorce how god looks at it and we're going to deal with more about how god looks at it a little later yep and sound doctrine is not being taught and right. that's kind of what i alluded to a minute ago mm -hmm. but sound doctrine is just not being taught sound doctrine teaches young men how to love their wives as christ loved the church this ends the divorce discussion mm -hmm. right <laughs> it teaches young ladies how to love their husbands and their children that ends the divorce discussion. Uh, loving God's way leaves no room for unforgiveness. So if sound doctrine is taught, then a lot of these divorces wouldn't take place because forgiveness would be there. Uh, Second uh, Timothy 4 and 3, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap upon themselves teachers. That's what we're seeing today. They won't endure it, meaning they can't handle it. They don't want to sit through it. I can't right. tell you how many times just traveling the world and speaking when I was doing mm -hmm. EX ministries, it would be so funny because when I would start the truth behind hip hop, people would come and I, I still couldn't figure out why they would come. Like, didn't you know? <laughs> and then when I would start and then as soon as I say something about fraternities, sororities, Masons, you know, anything that these folks really, really want to do, being yeah. famous, you know, being, mm -hmm. they would all just get up and start leaving. And I'd be like, why did you sit so close to the front and you knew <laughs> what I was going to do? Right. I, I never understood that, but right. that was, you know, I was able to watch how they, uh, over time, people just weren't able to endure sound teaching, which mm -hmm. is sound doctrine. They, were, they just couldn't handle it. I can't take it, especially when I have an option where I can go to a church where a movie star got the microphone <laughs> every Sunday and we're right. introducing them, you know, and letting him speak because he's in the audience. So that's where we are now because sound doctrine is not in place. It's easy for people to do what society does. It's easy for us to do what the world does because yeah. sound doctrine goes directly against what the world would do. Wow. wow. So let's do this because we always like to do everything according to the word of God. So if we look at the Bible, how does the Bible define at what does it define as grounds for divorce? Well, let, let's establish first that God hates divorce. As yes. I was just saying, we're going to deal with that. Right. God absolutely hates divorce. Um, and you can reference Malachi 2 and 16 for clarity of exactly what he says regarding it. So if God hates divorce, then why is that an option? Mm. That, that should be the kind of, if, if God absolutely hates divorce, we as his children, his ambassadors, his representatives in the earth, mm -hmm. why is that even a choice? So obviously there's, there's a reason he hates it, right? Mm -hmm. So if, if that's the case, then God, God always, I'm sorry, God always sees the big picture and the destruction it can bring to people. So that's why he hates it because he designed this thing <laughs> Mm -hmm. He has a purpose for why one man should be married to one woman until Jesus returns. And, and, and what comes out of that union, right, will be children, right, multiply, bear fruit in the earth. Right. So if, if there's a plan for that way, to, to pull anything out of that plan and just, if, if me and Pastor decide to walk right up the street together, right, we're going to go right, Pastor, right? Mm -hmm. Pastor's trusting me for whatever reason. I'm telling him we're going to go right, got a surprise for him. He don't know about it, what is going on. He decides to veer off to the left. But if he goes to the left, then I can't continue on with my surprise, right? Mm -hmm. So it just, it, 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 it deters us from the plan. It deters us from God's plan. So mm -hmm. the, the big picture is what God sees. He understands that it's going to lead to identity issues for the children. Right. Mm -hmm. He understands that it's going to leave a woman faithless. If the man is in your life, especially if we're talking about God-fearing men, mm -hmm. God is showing you and leading you in all of these things, and especially if you got some type of an audience. You mean to tell me that God can do all of these powerful things in your life pertaining to these people that come to hear you speak his word? Uh-oh. But you can't take the time out to make sure that you can keep this family together? Uh-oh. So Mold God, silence. again, Mold, sees Mold the Mold bigger silence. picture. He doesn't want us to fail or carry the shame of it. Matthew 19 and 8 says, He saith unto them, 
Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, suffered you to part, to put away your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. So God is telling you, look, because Moses was in charge at that moment and your hearts got, became, became so hardened, you wouldn't listen to the truth or to the way or you were just so, you know, bent, like pointed or uh, focused on the divorce. Your heart was hardened. He couldn't reason with you. OK, go ahead. Go ahead and get a divorce. But from the beginning, God said it, would, it wasn't that way. So. And, uh, you know, some of you said uh, he doesn't want us to fail or carry the shame of it. That's yeah. very important. Yeah. So God is really trying to protect your esteem mm -hmm. because for, in order for God to use you, like we talked about in the last uh, uh, episode, your esteem has to be right. Yes. Or you will use God. Yes. So uh, which one is it going to be? Is it going to be uh, God using you because you have your esteem in check and you know who you are or you allow a traumatic situation like divorce to make you feel a certain way about yourself. And now you're trying to use God to feel better about yourself. So he doesn't want you in that position. So that's why he hates divorce, because divorce a lot of times leads to this if a person doesn't uh, heal from it properly. And to answer your question mm -hmm. uh, about the biblical grounds for divorce, there are no biblical grounds for divorce. Okay, you can't just put that out there like that, Pastor. You have messed up somebody. You have messed up somebody. I'm I mean, sorry. somebody is shopping for another ring right, right. now because yeah. they felt right. like they had some, oh, you cheated on me. I yeah. got grounds for divorce. And of course, Matthew 5 and 32 and Matthew 19 and 9 are the so-called grounds for divorce scriptures. I right. get these scriptures all the time. All the time. I have grounds. But before I just check these folks on this particular scripture, let's just get something. Let's, let, let's understand. Jesus said that if you look at the a woman and lust Plus. after her, you have committed uh, adultery Adult. in your heart. So yeah, if is. adultery is grounds for divorce, then folks can get divorced because... You was riding with him and he saw a billboard and Kim Kardashian was on it. He was like, ooh, right. boy, oh, that's it. I'm out of here. That's a divorce. You, 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 because you just committed adultery. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you, folk like my illustrations. I like that illustration. Okay, okay, okay. But, um, so, I mean, so that can't be it. Okay. Right. That, it, it, that just, that, that's, that's irrational. Right. That makes no sense because Jesus told you that it's the same thing. Right. Right. So we know that's not what it's saying. The scripture says if a man divorces a woman except for fornication, the Greek word here is pornea, which, uh, 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 well, yeah, that's the Greek word pornea, which is fornication. And he marries another. He makes her commit yeah. adultery. adultery right. So you, you, you force her to commit adultery if you divorce her. So you have grounds for divorce, according to these folks, except for fornication. Talked about it last week. Fornication and adultery are not the same thing. They're they are the not same. interchangeable. Right. Both of them are not pornea. So we can't, we can't do that. We can't paint that picture. Pornea means fornication or sexual sin committed by the unmarried. Unmarried. Okay. Right? Yeah. So if that be the case, then Matthew here is speaking of fornication prior to marriage. And back then, if we were to just take this back to when it was spoken, they would do the sheets test to test for adultery, a test for fornication right. to make sure that uh, the woman hadn't defrauded herself prior or, or had sex before she was married. She was still a virgin. Right. Women would go in, get the sheets. They would bring the report or the, whatever. That used to be the standard. That used to be the standard. Yeah. yeah. And so back then they would do that. Man, they would take berries back there and bust them in the sheets. I mean, they yeah. would do whatever to yeah. try to pass the test. Yeah. And they'd be... This is a true story. This is true. <laughs> they would. They be trying to get over. You trying to get over on these hey. folks. But them old women, they was like, oh, no, nah, baby. <laughs> nah, ah. no, no, no. So I know a blueberry stain. Right. That ain't no, no. So they, they had all. <laughs> so they had these tests. That they would do to make sure that she was she she was really she was really a virgin. I love it. <laughs> All right. So this is what the scripture actually was referring to. Yes. He's, that's yes. why he said fornication. Right. All the new translations, the NIV, the IVV, the PIT, the, the whatever it is. All the new all the new translations tried to make them interchangeable and just say sexual immorality. 
that, that that's a bad translation. The King James 1611, which is what I tell folks to go by, it definitely uses the right word pornonia here, which is fornication, to let you know this is sex prior to marry. So the only grounds of divorce is sex prior to marry, and you said you was a virgin. Right. He found out that you weren't. Mm -hmm. And that that was grounds for divorce. So when Christ says, save fornication, mm -hmm. oh, the Lord dropped this in my spirit. Is he saying that it is unforgivable? Mm -hmm. So is he saying it's unforgivable? Is the son of God that died for the sins of all stating that there is a sin that is so unforgivable that it warrants doing what his father hates? Mm -hmm. And if sexual sin is unforgivable and grounds is God allowing us to judge sin by divorcing? It's a hard question. <laughs> Christ is saying that if you marry someone and you accept who they are, you are bound to them and should work out any differences. Just like he's bound to us, working out our crazy differences. <laughs> when he married us and was bound to us, he stuck with us. He said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. As crazy as we've been. Have you been crazy, Jay Brown? I have been have crazy. Have you been crazy? Come in. Yes. I've been crazy. No, I've so been crazy. He, he, he stayed there. He's, he's bound to us. And he said, we should be bound to them and should work out any difference that occurs because we're both human. So there's God to be differences but if they defrauded you and claimed to be a virgin then you can divorce them or you could divorce them back then if you chose to because they are not who you thought they were so you were defrauded that's what the scripture is saying right some try to apply this to homosexuality and sexual preference and that's not what jesus was stating so he wasn't saying she I, you said you were straight but then when i married you i found that you you knew he was gay which camera can I look cross-eyed in? <laughs> you knew he was gay. You, you, I, why don't people come tell me that? I, I mean, I, I just didn't see. Oh, you know. He just had went shoes, feminine ways. No, y'all went shoe shopping and you was in the car. He was still in there. In Nine West. <laughs> <laughs> Is that a story? <laughs> why did he stay after you left? So that's what I'm saying. You knew. So but folks try to use <laughs> folks try to use that. No, no, no. Let's stick to what the Bible specifically says. It says fornication that has to be prior to marriage. He was referring to the sheet test of the Old Testament to prove virginity. That's what he was doing. So but pastor, go with me here for a second. So even, even if we leave aside all that you just said. All we have to do is look at Ephesians five, where it says husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Right. So yeah. has the church ever committed adultery? Mm. Mm. Yes. Yes. So again, Ephesians five husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church. And I'll ask again, has the church <laughs> ever committed adultery? Gone after false gods, gone after. False... Definitely. Yes. So. Should we be willing to forgive like God does? Right. If we gonna love them like the church, if, if 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 it's telling us to, right, we should be willing to forgive the same way God does. So when you talk about divorce or the idea or the or the, the conversation of divorce comes up, really, this person that you've had children with, this person that you've been through ups and downs with, this person that you've supported or been supported in the loss of life with somebody. I mean, there's so many different scenarios and avenues we could travel down when it comes. You mean to tell me it's not worth saving? It's not worth sacrificing for? Right. Yes, the it is. We can forgive. We what would Jesus do? We don't well, have those. Right, right. Well, they always say, well, Jesus wasn't married. Mm, mm, mm. See, I guess the church wasn't his bride. But anyway, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah. So, you know, what, what, what in that in that scenario, the, the church has committed adultery uh, mm -hmm. time and time again. So if, if God can forgive the church, then we can absolutely forgive our spouses. Yeah. And these folks could not have been in the Old Testament. Oh, no, no. Because the Old Testament leaders of old had the worst marriages ever. Yeah. yeah. They, I mean, Old Testament marriages were the worst. Yeah. They were the worst of the worst. Yeah. They had the worst marital situations from marrying prostitutes, uh, polygamy, concubines, adultery, murder, etc. All this stuff was happening under the roof. Constantly. I mean, just crazy. Uh, Handmaiden, sex. I mean, they was doing just, I mean, everything. All types of stuff. Every marriage you look at in the Old Testament was horrible. And there is no divorce anywhere in the Old Testament among patriarchs. Right. Mm -hmm. None.
looking out. They all endured. Amen. They all gutted it out. Matthew 18 and 21. Then Peter came to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me? And I forgive him seven times. Jesus was like, Peter, no, seven times 70 until 70 times seven. That's how many times you do it. Yeah. And if that's for your brother, mm -hmm. then what about the union that God has put together and you've become one with this person? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. This, and the story that go with that is is, is deep. So a servant went to the master, and that's in that same chapter, Matthew 18, a servant went to the master, right? And he owed. Mm -hmm. And so the master was going to do something to him and his wife. Mm -hmm. The servant begged the master not to do it, right? Mm -hmm. Master spared him. But then the servant went back, and his servant owed him some money. He, the Bible says he <laughs> choked him. <laughs> yeah, he went off. <laughs> he choked the man, got him tossed in jail the whole nine. So the people who witnessed the mercy he had just uh, just received from the other master went and told him, like, hey, he didn't forgive his uh, his servant. Right. So the master in return said, OK, well, since you, I, you're not going to take the same mercy and grace that I apply to you to your, your servant, then I'm going to put you in jail. Mm -hmm. That's how God views it. We so we're we, gnashing of teeth. Uh, it's just it's just crazy. But anyway, yeah. So that, that that story in and of itself, it has many lessons tied to it. So we can forgive if we take the time, as you stated earlier, if we take the time. And um, just process everything. And you know, and let me say this before break. Talk to somebody. A, a, a lot of these issues are coming because folks have set the bad marriage on fire by talking to everybody about it. Talk, yes, sir. See, they done went to their family. They done called him a jive mm -hmm. turkey. They done got on the phone. They done got on Facebook, Ooh. on the internet. And so now they can't live it down to even forgive them because you've made, you've joined the opposition and you've enhanced you know, you've enhanced the other side. Yeah. And so now it's hard for you to, to, to forgive because your business is out there. And right. You feel like you're going to look some kind of way, even though you look some kind of way anyway for running your mouth. Yeah. But still, some folks are just, they're, they're such busy bodies. And that's why I always say, you know, when I talk to people, even at the church, when I'm counseling or whatever, I say, keep your business because you always want to leave room for reconciliation. Amen. So stay private. Don't talk to anybody about it. It's nobody's business. Don't be sending me emails. Email. My husband keep looking at porn and did that. And your pictures on Facebook, his pictures on Facebook. Y'all didn't. Then when he get delivered, all the pictures still on Facebook. Right. And so that's what I'm saying. Will you get somewhere and keep your business? That's sound doctrine, though. Being discreet. Being discreet. According to sound doctrine. And that's something that the older women are supposed to teach, teach. the younger women. Yeah. But the younger women are being taught by social media while the older women grabbing the mic and preaching to the entire congregation. That's the issue here. Right. Well, you know, they talk about being a boss all the time for women now online. You see that a lot. I feel like a real boss is the one who can protect their husband at any cost. Uh -oh. That's a boss. We got to take a break. We're going to be back with more hey. talking about divorce and marriage. It's the exposition. <laughs> Hi, I'm G. Craig Lewis, and I want to talk to you about our brand new video, Strengthening the Bond. It is a must for all parents, teens, and leaders. With the rise in broken marriages, homes, and families, we need a reality check. Where is this going? What happens when marriage is no longer a sacred institution, and the norm is for children to be born to single or same-sex parents? What will happen to our education system when 90% of our youth are sexually active? What will happen to our youth if they continue to eat unhealthy foods, watch unhealthy television programming, and continue to contract STDs at a 1 to 4 ratio? If we, as the people of God, don't stand up now, we won't have any say in these matters later on. We must stand now. Get this new DVD, Strengthening the Bond, and learn how to preserve the family that God created. Oh, okay. and, 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 and how they coped with, man, we got to figure out how to make this work. We got kids, man. you know. Um, I'm curious, have you and Shana and your former wife, yeah. how was that relationship building? Um, it's difficult. Okay. Yeah, it's difficult. Um you know, going into the new relationship, 
I went into it messy. You know what I'm saying? Like yeah. I I didn't I didn't put the old one to bed fully. Okay. Um, I thought I was being forthright. In a lot of ways, I thought I was being very honest, you know what I'm saying? But I hadn't, I didn't understand things about myself. I would say, I mean, where he left off as far as me coming out to Columbus to see what was really going on when he was married, like that's when I called it quits. Mm -hmm. You know, I was like, you know, this isn't, it's not where I thought it was. This isn't going to work like this. Um, So I did listen to that inner voice (laughs) and I shut it down. And from that point, that's when... You know, he had to be honest with her Mm -hmm. and had to be honest with me. And we had to figure out whether or not we were going to continue. Right. So, gentlemen, in part one, I think we gave a lot of people a lot of things to think about as it relates to divorce and and marriage and things like that, especially as it relates to what it says in the Bible. But what happens in the situation when we hear that and now we have to face the fact that we left our spouses for the wrong reasons? We have to come to terms with the fact that it was not God. But it was us. We were in our own feelings and we've now torn our families apart. I mean, is there a way that we can fix it according to the word of God? Oh, yeah, this this is easy. Well, now I don't know about easy. <laughs> Reconciliation. Mm-hmm. Um, Reconciliation is easy for somebody that <laughs> stayed married and didn't divorce. Right, so, right. <laughs> right, right, right. But, but, but re- reconciliation, um, you know, if we are in Christ, mm-hmm. then we should attempt to reconcile every single time. Right. Um, what we shouldn't do is be looking for another marriage to get into, but what we should be doing is figuring out what's wrong with us. But they say the best way to get over is to get under. That's boyfriend and girlfriend in the in the playground. Oh, <laughs> sorry. But if you think about it, <laughs> it's not marriage. If if you think about it, you know, marriage is a fifty fifty thing. Okay. So mm-hmm. no matter how you slice it, it's two humans. So it's two people that takes that, that it's going to take two people to make it work. Okay. All right. So. If your 50 didn't work in the first marriage, <laughs> <laughs> right, um, then it's probably not going to work anywhere else. And I think that that's what happens in the situation. Pastor uh, alluded to, the, unfortunately, statist- statistically speaking now, 70% being women who, who are leading the divorce um, conversation or action, it's emotional. Mm-hmm. So you're going to take that, that, that same, in that, in that instance, in that context, you're going to take that same irrational emotion and you're going to apply it to the next situation. And you're going to find yourself in the same situation again. So are you just going to keep marrying and divorcing or are you going to start this narrative you don't believe in marriage anymore? <laughs> so what you're what you essentially saying is you refuse to take responsibility for your part in it. And I think that's what it takes. It takes both parties involved, man and, and, and woman. Let's clarify that. Both parties involved, man and woman. Look at yourself and say, what can I do? Don't sit up there and just say, okay, it's her, it's her, it's her. She need to do this, she need to do this, she need to do this, and vice versa. Take a look at yourself. Get yourself together. Go get, your, go get around some strong men. Get some counsel, right? And then start applying things day by day and then commit to the time that it's going to take to get back to where you want to be because that's the thing. You got to commit to the time that it's going to take. But yeah, if it's 50-50, you know, you got you to gotta work on that reconciliation part. Work on your 50. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Because you're going to take, like you said, you're going to take it into another relationship. Absolutely. So, and that's what I'm saying. Why do people wait till they get divorced to go get healed and rebuilt and remolded, <laughs> reshaped, remade? Re- <laughs> Why are you getting all this re after the divorce? Right. Why don't you get re during the divorce? Right. Why don't y'all do this together? Why don't you... Put all of this time in there. Why you? Why does your heart have to be open and all the ventricles showing right. before you get to a place to where you will work on yourself? Do that in the marriage. But why you got to tell everybody about all your re? <laughs> why your re just can't be re? Why all got on to be the on the internet? Yeah. I'm just reborn. Yeah. Albums out. What was the album? Alone but not alone. alone. But not alone. Marvin Wine got an album. Alone, just wrote an album about not being alone. divorced and how I'm alone but not alone. Oh, Brother. you alone? That's why you wrote about it. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. You wouldn't have time to write it if you right. wouldn't. But that's that, that, that's that's I, I don't like all that public, you know, just putting it out in the public. Right. Uh, you know, you really need to deal with yourself privately. And it's not you dealing with yourself by you picking this book up and you reading this. Whatever. No, God wants to discuss this with you. And that's I what I tell everybody. You know, I said, what did God say? Mm-hmm. Ain't nobody going to tell me God told him to divorce. 
Why would he say for, tell you to do the thing that he hates? hates. He right. just re rebuked Moses in the Bible for giving people the writ of divorce because Jesus stated that it wasn't like that from the beginning. Right. Right. So what are we talking about here? You're going to go to God. They don't want to go to God because God going to tell them, hey, I put up with your crazy self. <laughs> yeah. Why can't you put up with some crazy? You know, and so God wants to discuss this with you. This is the mistake that so many of them make after you make a decision of this magnitude where so many lives are affected, you can't just get up and go on your way. Right. There must be a good lengthy period of seeking wise counsel, sound doctrine, repairing, rebuilding, restoring yourself and your family the best you can. So mm -hmm. this applies to what you were saying. Mm -hmm. Okay, I, I, I messed up. I shouldn't have done it. What do I do now? Well, right. you get before God and make sure there is a good lengthy period. What does lengthy mean? Long. Long period of seeking wise counsel. How long did it take you to get crazy? Right. Well, then it needs to take some time for you to, to uncrazy yourself. Go through a long, lengthy period of seeking wise counsel, sound doctrine, rebuilding, restoring yourself and your family the best you can. This comes through a strict communion with God, period. Yeah. You have to have that. I was talking about that Sunday in the sermon. It's, I mean, why, why do we go hard after everything else but God? But God, yeah. That's true. Why are we willing to risk everything? And, and, and I mean, folks dieting just to be fine, but came fast to be okay. Mm -hmm. Right. And it, it, just, it just doesn't make sense. This comes through a strict communion with God, period. Why do we feel we can just Google answers and move forward? Mm -hmm. I mean, why do we think we could just, uh, what, 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 what the scripture say about divorce and just Google first thing pop up? Oh, yep. See it, see it. Okay. Okay. I got grounds. And so I'm good. And mm. then your next post, I'm good. That's your next like, post. Like, 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 <laughs> comment, comment, comment. I'm good, y'all. I'm, I'm good. Yeah. I'm good driving. I'm going live on Facebook. I just want to let y'all know I'm, I'm good. good. <laughs> what, what, <laughs> Why do people do that, man? That's if crazy. it was good, you wouldn't have to say it. You could exactly. show it. Why you got to say it? Exactly. But God has to intervene if you desire his will to be instituted. So go off the grid, unplug, fast and pray. Find out what happened. Yeah. What happened? Yeah. God, tell me what happened. Mm -hmm. Why don't people do that? I don't know, because he will tell you. Tell me, Lord, what happened. Happened? What happened to this relationship? Because I don't want to be wrong. See, if I talk to God about it, he's going to point at me. Well, oh. that, and, and that's what folks need to do. Because if it's you, then you're going to take it in the next marriage right. or the next situation. You got to work so, on your 50. That's right. Work on your 50. Man, I need to make shirts. James 4 and 8 says, draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts. Ye double minded. So drawing nigh to God, he will draw nigh to you. Yeah. In other words, God will not draw nigh to you if you don't draw nigh to him. Well, let's talk about one important fact, especially with this whole divorce thing, and that is the children. Now, it's a proven fact that the children process the death of a parent better than they do divorce. And why is that? How do we help them heal from it? I mean, how do we take care of our children? Well, you know, I. I I come from a divorced family. I'm, I'm a product of that, and, and I understand the pain of it, right? So if, if you think about it, um, kids adapt to whatever world you create for them. So even while you're going through something, they're not aware of it as long as you don't make them aware of it. Mm -hmm. So it can be the worst of times. You can literally feel like you're waking up in flames of fire. You know, you're going to bed in flames of fire, and the kids will be prancing around there like they're on a water slide 24 hours a day. So. What I needed was the truth and a confession of what went wrong so that I can process it the way that I can process it mm -hmm. and go from there. I didn't need to hear how someone couldn't forgive. I didn't need to hear how it was a bad decision. And I, I, but what I needed to hear is how it was a bad decision mm -hmm. and that it shouldn't have been done. Right. And eventually I, I got to that, um, but I had to plant myself in the fellowship where I saw strong marriages in a proper light and where I seen people endure temptations um, and overcome failures together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if even if I come from a divorced family and then I grow up and I see everybody consistently divorcing left, right, left, right, even if I do make the decision to actually marry myself, I don't have a foundation in sticking it out right. mm -hmm. and, and, and trying to figure out how to stay together or the fruit of. Because mm -hmm. that's the thing. Anybody can say we're going to stick it out and they can still be, you know, a, a, a world of hell behind closed doors. But being able to actually see the fruit of it, how children are. Are, you know, they adjust again to that environment. So if 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 
if ever I come to a point where I need to have a tough conversation with my wife, I understand that the, in that tough conversation, mm -hmm. we just got to be patient. Let me work on my 50. Mm -hmm. Wife will work on her 50. And then we'll keep it 100 in front of the children. There you go. And then when they grow older, all they'll know is make sure it lasts as long as it's supposed to last, which the Bible says, which our Bible says is forever until mm -hmm. death do us part. Right. But unfortunately, but, we don't see that a lot. Unfortunately, what happens is there's so much anger. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of times, in most cases, it's the woman. Your daddy ain't this. He ain't that. He left us because of this. He got because of that. Pastor, how do we deal with that as it relates to our children? Because they looking at mad mama and they trying to suck but, all that in. But think about this, too. It used to be conviction from the church family. People used to stick it out because of that conviction they would feel. As we as we talked about earlier, it's, it's the examples of the leaders. They started divorcing like it wasn't anything wrong with it mm -hmm. so once you start that from the leadership it's gonna it's gonna it's funny how they want the oil for all the other stuff to trickle down but they don't want to mm -hmm. <laughs> they don't understand what's trickling down from bad leadership you understand what i'm saying mm -hmm. so if i'm going to church and i'm saying you know you got that mother looking at you like you better stay home with your husband right instead you got the the pastor saying i'm leaving or i have left or i'm on my third or fourth there then of course if i want a divorce that church is going to get bigger by the number, specifically mm -hmm. because of that particular example that's being upheld, unfortunately. Yeah. And, you know, back back to your question. Well, your, even your original question about the children uh, and, and how they process. You stated how they process divorce, uh, uh, the yeah. death of a parent mm -hmm. yeah. uh, better than they do divorce. Um, it's because when parents make a choice of who gets the kids, it sounds like who gets the kids. But to the kid, or it sounds like, who really wants, wants me? Right. And that's, that's, that's the tough. issue. Yeah. <laughs> this is the abandonment, and it takes, this is abandonment, and it takes a toll on the children for the rest of their lives. Mm -hmm. Like, abandonment issues don't go away. 40, 50 years old, you're still dealing with abandonment <laughs> issues of when you were abandoned True. by a parent. Mm -hmm. uh, they will uh, battle self-worth issues, break, breaking loose uh, from toxic people. They will have an issue. Well, first, let me slow this down. They'll... They'll battle self-worth issues because if you feel like somebody didn't want you, right. then that lowers your esteem because you feel like I did something or there's something I should have done mm -hmm. or I could have done or they may have broken up because of the burden I am. Mm -hmm. And that lowers a, a, a young person's esteem and you have to be built up from that. Uh, and then it takes a toll on them uh, breaking loose from toxic people. Because once you've been abandoned, you don't want to be the abandoner. Mm -hmm. So you hold on to everybody. You drag in the island of misfit friends, <laughs> island of misfit family, island of misfits. I mean, you root off on that island all your life. And all yeah. they're doing is holding you back, keeping you from where you're supposed to go. Because you can't let nobody go because you don't want them to feel like you felt when you were young. Yep. And your dad let you go or let the family go. And so you battle that or you battle entitlement issues because you were it was there was an overcompensation in your home. Yep. Like your mama gave you too much love. She gave you she made you think you was the king. So now you <laughs> out in the real world thinking you the king. You thinking you all that and you just as whack. Yeah. But you're just entitled or young girl just overly, you, you know, the, 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 uh, the parent that stayed with them compensates for the missing parent or when they go visit the the other parent he got to make up for the time that he's not with them mm -hmm. and so the child gets a false sense of what the real world is like they think the world caters to them mm -hmm. right and so when real rules and stuff that's why they start singing no rules no religion i made my decision mm -hmm. because they come from these situations where the rules were bent in their favor and God don't bend rules. Right. And so it's hard for them to adhere to Christianity and all of that. They got all of this stuff going on. Uh, and that's why Proverbs 22 and six says, train up a child in the way he should go. It takes a mother and a father to do that without a mother or a father. The child can't be trained up wholly in the way they should go. God designed it a certain way so that when they're old, they won't depart from it. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the biggest questions that we receive uh, as we prepare for this is based on remarriage. Mm -mm. Now, some have been taught that you can only remarry once your former spouse is deceased. Then we have some cases where they believe that you can only reconnect with your ex-spouse, even if they are a non-believer. 
So we've got to give some direction for those that are in this position. Okay, so the, the Bible specifically tells the wife not to leave her husband. Okay. And if she does, she needs to remain unmarried. Period. So if she leaves her husband, she can't get married again. She should remain unmarried. That's the same thing, right? Mm -hmm. All right. So 1 Corinthians 7 and 10. And unto the married I command, this is Paul, but then he says, yet not I, mm. clarifying that it's not of, of him. This is, this is God telling him to speak on God's behalf. So this is God talking through Paul. Mm -hmm. Yet not I, but the Lord. Let not the wife depart from her husband, but, and if she depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband and let not the husband put away his wife. So in that situation where if the wife decides, hey, I want a divorce, she leaves in that she receives counseling, conviction. She repents. She goes back to the husband. The Bible just told the husband, you can't push her away. You have to accept, right? Right. And let not the husband put away his wife. So again, reconciliation is God has designed us to be reconciled to one another the same way he designed for us to be reconciled back to him mm -hmm. through Jesus Christ. Right. Yep. Yep. And it was something you said uh, when he said, let not the wife depart from her husband, but if she depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled. Those are your choices. So if you decide to bounce out of the marriage, stop emailing me and asking me what you should do when the Bible is telling you, if you decide to divorce your husband, you must remain unmarried or reconcile with him. Mm -hmm. And this is to the woman that the Bible is speaking. And also when he said, yet not I, but the Lord, he's also referring to the fact that Jesus said this. Right. OK, so Jesus said this first. It was already written. So he's saying, I'm telling you that. But then he comes. But to the rest, I, not the Lord, uh, the rest speak, I, not the Lord, meaning, OK, Jesus didn't say this, but I'm saying it under the divine inspiration of the Lord. And I hate when people try to, well, this is Paul's words of that. <laughs> the New Testament is Paul's words. All oh, people get on my nerves <laughs> with that. He was divinely inspired by God to write it. He's just saying Jesus didn't say this before. Right. I'm saying this uh -huh. now. So that does not make it. Paul's opinion. Right. Oh, I'm so tired of these folks with Paul's opinion. Man, why do you read the Bible if it's just an opinion? An opinion, right. Because, you know, if it's an opinion, that means that yours is valid. Mm -hmm. uh, well, my opinion's not valid. I, I'm going to go with what the inspired by God writer And said. I'm not Paul. Th there you go. There you go. And I don't want to be him. No. He did this for us. I'll use it. <laughs> But he said, not uh, uh, I speak, I not the Lord. If any brother hath a wife that believe not and she be pleased to dwell with him, let him not put her away. And the woman which has a husband that believe not. So this is a, a man, a, a wife that a man that has a wife that's not saved or a wife that has a husband that's not saved. If he be pleased to dwell with her, let her not leave him. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Else were your children unclean, but now are they holy? So he's saying stay there if they want you to stay. I mean, if he wants to stay, you keep them because you can win them. Got a church full of folks who did that who one of them wasn't saved, the other was won by their behavior once they got their 50 together. Talk about it. Amen. The Bible is teaching here that you can win the unbelieving by your actions. When the roles, this is the key though, are in accordance to God, usually things can be reconciled. Yes. So if you ain't uh, sitting up in the house with her braiding your hair before <laughs> she go to work uh... and paying the bills, then that situation could probably be reconciled if you're the head of the home. It takes the roles to do it, though. Right. Um, and so that when the roles are in accordance to God, usually things can be reconciled. OK, but wait, we got to bring a little more clarity. What about when an unsaved person leaves a saved person and starts a new relationship or either remarries? Well, the Bible says you're not bound to them either. OK. Uh, first Corinthians 7 15. But if the unbelieving depart, mm -hmm. meaning the unsaved, if they leave, let them depart. A brother or a sister is not under bondage in su such cases. 
But God hath called us to peace. Now, don't you be trying to make him depart. Right, right. <laughs> I, I mean, when the when the, the the Dead Sea clay all day. I mean, don't, don't be. <laughs> the Dead Sea clay. <laughs> what? The mask. You know, right, 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 the Dead right. Sea mask, hair yeah. up in uh, rollers all day, looking all stank. Mm-hmm. You going to stay? Don't be trying to run. Because <laughs> if you save, you have to. I mean, we're, we're dealing with a hard issue. So you, 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 if, if, if he leaves you because he just don't want to be in Christ, tired of, you know, just just leaves. Then the Bible says you are, um, you know, let him depart. And it also says a brother or a sister mm-hmm. is not under bondage mm-hmm. in such cases. So the Bible is very specific and let you know. That if they leave you, especially for the cause of Christ, then you're not bound to. Okay. Well, can we look at one other issue, which is Ooh, call adultery? Me. Got the questions today. We got to talk about this, Pastor. This is a really serious problem. What about adultery? Let's look at Luke 16 and 18. Now we know that Scripture says that whosoever putteth away his wife and marrieth another committed adultery, and whosoever marrieth her that is put away from her husband committed adultery. So are we to read that and say that this is saying that we are living in a state of adultery if we remarry after divorce and your spouse is still living? Okay. And I'm going to have to close with this one, son. You're going to have to let me take this one. Go on ahead. You got it. <laughs> but this is, this is deep because, I mean, there are people that have ministries that accuse people of living in a, a constant state of adultery because they remarried, they're condemning people, different things like that. And so if we go into the word, we can find answers for this. I mean, and the, the Bible answers everything. Um, so we know two things for sure, and I'm closing with this, but it's going to be a long close. We know two things for sure. We know God hates divorce yes. mm-hmm. and God is merciful and forgiving. Okay. Two. So we know those two. Mm-hmm. Does God forgive divorce? Definitely. Yes. Divorce is no less forgivable than any yeah. other sin. The Bible does not make it unpardonable. Forgiveness of all sins is available through faith in Jesus, Jesus Christ. Christ. Right? Yes. Amen. So is this remarriage that you're alluding to mm-hmm. an act of adultery or a state of adultery? Mm-hmm. It's definitely an act of it because it's not listed as the unpardonable sin. Matthew 12 and 31 tells us the only unpardonable sin. Wherefore, I say unto you, all manner of sin. How, how many manners of sin? All. All, how many? all manner all. of sin. How much is all? That's all, all sin. So all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men. Divorce is included in that. Yeah. Right? Adultery is included in that. But the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. So that's giving you the unpardonable sin. And if, you know, just to bring clarity to what Jesus was talking about there, they were accusing him of using the devil's power. Right. And so Jesus knew that the Pharisees, who are now modern day Masons, Mm -hmm. Freemasons, knew that they were operating in the dark in witchcraft and black magic and voodoo and all of these different things. Basically, satanic power, uh, because that's what masonry is, is satanic power. And, you know, you're trying to use the lost books of Solomon and all these different things, all the false God stuff and magic or whatever. So he knew they were secretly doing that. So when they accused him of using that same power, Jesus was like, OK, yeah, now now you done messed up. <laughs> this is unpardonable because if my power, if, if you say my power is from the devil, you can't be saved yeah, you because me. you can't be saved by the devil's power. So that's the unforgivable sin of blasphemy. I just thought I'd mm-hmm. clarify that because some folks just don't know. Some folks think they blaspheme. I remember a cousin of mine cussed at a funeral and cussed at God because grandmama was dead. They didn't let him back in the church for the rest of his life. They said, boy, you blaspheme the Holy Ghost. You can't come back to church. Mm. I don't mm-hmm. know where that boy is. Mm-hmm. But that's just bad scripture. <laughs> that's bad proof text. Right. <laughs> so I just explained <laughs> blaspheming the Holy Ghost. Okay, okay. So uh, to believe... <clears throat> That divorce is an unpardonable offense doesn't agree with that scripture I just read, right? It doesn't agree with scripture. Mm -hmm. Divorce can be forgiven uh, if a person is truly repentant. This is defined by their heart. So I don't get caught up in a whole lot of he say, she say, what you saying, what you do. 
God is going to judge the heart. That's why we can't judge people, because God knows exactly their reasons for doing this. You know, you meet and weep and cried and prayed for marriage and they already got their eyes on somebody else. Yep. And so you have to let God judge the heart. Adultery is not a perpetual state, according to the Bible, because divorcing is not a perpetual act. And adultery as it applies to what you were saying. Right. So remarriage and committing adultery because you remarried or causing somebody to commit adultery because you remarried is not a perpetual state because divorcing is not a perpetual state. So if you're divorcing, if you are divorced, then the proceeding ended and rendered you single. Right. Right. right? So it's not a continual Proceeding, you're continually divorcing. You're right. always divorcing. It would have to be that for it to be continual or perpetual adultery. Right. Remarriage does not place you in a perpetual state of adultery. However, the consequences of divorce and remarriage are perpetual. Yes, they are. Sin has consequence, and some consequences never go away. Right. This is why God hates divorce. It permanently damages the victims of it. So God may have forgiven you, but the consequences aren't so forgiven. They linger. And in the case of children, they change the course of their lives. God hates when children are offended, especially by Christians, because it changes how he, God, is perceived to them. Based on the Bible, forgiveness is the key. You shouldn't remarry if you divorce someone. But if you have been abandoned by an unbelieving spouse, you are not bound. This does not mean you run out and find someone. Right. <laughs> this yeah. means you are not spiritually bound to their issues. Soul ties can be broken. Mm -hmm. In this state, it's time to seek God before you ever embark on another marital journey. OK. In the end, we will all be accountable for our actions done and we will have to give an account for the decisions that we made. Right. But even now, we must for, uh, face the consequences of our decisions and divorce can permanently damage our future and the state of our children. Mark 10 and 6 says, but from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife. Uh, so I got a break right there because something just came on me. Mm -hmm. This is why we got so many divorces is because folks ain't leaving the leave. father and they the mother leave, and right. cleaving. Yeah. And I'm not talking about physically leaving. What about these opinions? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Why are you still telling your mama everything? Why does right. your mama know what's going on between you and your husband? Talk right. about it. You know, I thank God. My wife, you know, we, we, we've we been married 28 years. We've gone through some things or whatever. But man, don't nobody know but us. Yeah. We deal with it, man. My mamas, and I mean, we, I love them, but they don't need to be in our business like that. That's the issue. Once you start getting everybody on your side, mm. now they're pushing you to, for, for justice. Yep. <laughs> you could have made up, but now they all mad. Now they all involved. Oh, you went back to them or whatever, whatever. So folks haven't left their father and their mother. Still getting money from them. Oh my God. Tough. Yeah. You yeah. ain't left your mother and your father. That's, That's the tough. problem. Yeah. The Bible said, for this cause <laughs> shall a man leave his father and mother and then do what? Cleave to his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. Talking so, about it. So then they are no more two, but one flesh. Wank. What therefore God hath joined together, let no man put asunder.